will begin with a keynote address by uh, Mr. Hari Verbeyen. He is the executive director of the Europeana Foundation, the operator of the European platform. Uh, Europeana supports heritage institutions and uh, makes their digital collections available as widely as possible so that people can find and use them. And let me stress that we are very proud that the metadata from the Croatian web archive is also part of the Europeana. The work of Europeana is guided by creative collaboration, supportive teamwork, and the idea that sharing and reusing cultural content can positively transform the world. I will now give the floor to Harry, who will give a presentation entitled Mirror World. Harry, please. Good morning, everyone. Ooh, it sounds a bit loud. You all right? Okay. Good morning, and thank you very much for that very nice uh, introduction. Um, I wanted to start with giving you a slight feedback loop on my own career. I started in 1998 as a microfilm publisher. That was my, really, my, my first real job after finishing college uh, as a historian. <coughs> Now, I'm sure you all cool web archive people know still what microfiche and microfilm publishing is, right? Um, that was a, a technology developed in the 1950s. And uh, by 1999, when I started as a young man uh, in that world, that was already a fairly outdated uh, mechanism. However, I was there and I went to New York and there was a fantastic opportunity uh, to start in this world. <clears throat> because essentially it is still, in my opinion, very much the same world as the world that you are uh, in today, that I am in today. We contribute to bringing history to the future. That was the slogan of the organization I worked for at the time called IDC Publishers, now part of Brill. I don't know, maybe that still rings a bell with you. So in 1999, I had this opportunity and I went to New York uh, as a young, I'm a Dutchman, uh, so I thought that was the most amazing opportunity ever, uh, going to New York and then traveling all across America uh, with my catalog of microfiche publishing uh, material. So we're talking 16th century reformatory pamphlets, we're talking Comintern archives, the, the Russian archives, <coughs> and I hit all the Ivy League big uh, university library campuses and I thought this was just the most amazing thing I felt really proud of what I was doing. Uh, I, guess, I guess I studied history because fundamentally I just didn't really know my position in life. You know, well, what are we uh, as human beings and what am I as Harry Rewine in that big constellation? And that's why I got into history and I was really happy that I could contribute this way uh, professionally to making all that history available in meaningful ways. So while hitting those campuses in America, at a certain point, I came to San Francisco. And in San Francisco, of course, is the Presidio, and that is where the Internet Archive resides. And in 1999, I was uh, introduced to what they were doing there, Brewster Kale, a uh, famous man in your world and in mine, uh, an amazing person, uh, really someone, a big visionary in my opinion. And uh, he showed me what he was doing, and he showed me all the service decks, and I said, Damn, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> I shouldn't be in microfilm publishing. I should be in the web archiving business. Okay, so uh, it never came to that until this point. I'm really happy to be here. Very proud that I've been invited. Um, so what happened in the meantime? I uh, left my job at IDC Publishing. I uh, joined a big international academic publisher called, uh, at the time, Kluwer Academic. And Kluwer Academic is one of those big uh, organizations that starts to morph into something else. It's now called Springer. Had a fantastic time there uh, working with the uh, web development team, developed ebooks, reference works, those type of things. But at a certain point, I got really tired with that organization. 
Uh, it's the type of organization that has lost its soul, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, <clears throat> it got bought, it got sold, it got bought again, it merged. Um, and I got really lost, and I thought to myself, you know, what the hell am I doing here? Um, I thought we were doing something meaningful, but it seems like the private equity firms on top are only interested in making more money. And that was at the time when open access started to become an important factor. And I thought, wow, that's an opportunity to, to do something meaningful. We now have the opportunity to use the force of the web, which is basically a big copying machine, and make material available as widely as possible. Of course, the organization I worked for wasn't really into it. They were in a protective mode uh, because you know, they, they make their money on IP and they're not so interested in making it available as widely as possible. I moved on. I uh, spent some time in a very nice uh, little enterprise in Amsterdam, a think tank called Knowledge Land, and that opened my eyes to all kinds of new things. It was really it was a complete shock, actually, uh, coming from a big corporate organization to go to a 15 people organization again, uh, and, and I got really rebooted. And uh, from there we did uh, all kinds of things. We worked in, uh, <coughs> we introduced uh, Creative Commons in uh, the digital world in the, in the Netherlands at the time. Uh, we developed open business models and it was a very, uh, very explorative phase for me. Until Europeana came across, and that was in 2008. And uh, the director at the time, Jill Cousins, uh, invited me to join the team at a very early stage. And um, it was a ball, to be frank, uh, a roller coaster all the way from 2008 till last year um, when we celebrated our 10 year anniversary. And uh, Jill Cousins left, and I got the opportunity to become the director of this organization. I felt very proud of that. I thought it was, again, a strike of luck. So what, what do you do when you take over as a director? I've been there, I had been there for nine years already, so it wasn't a new organization to me. And people keep asking me now, so how does it feel to be the director of this organization? What did you do? And they, they look at me like there was a, a big master plan behind it, that I had it all figured out, and of course you don't. So, I think in retrospect, a year into this, I can say that uh, what happened is that at first, you know, you, you do a little repair job here there, right? You work, you know where the, the friction is in the organization, so you do a little bit of repair there so that people feel a bit more comfortable. You hope the, the ship doesn't sink. That's really uh, one of the things that, uh, that I experience. And then, uh, you know, you work a bit on your external relationships. You <clears throat> make sure that the relationship with the European Commission, the big funder for European uh, is healed a bit. I think, you know, over 10 years you have some frictions, like in any marriage, um, and you need to do some repair job. But six months ago, I started thinking of myself, well, <clears throat> the ship still floats, it's actually sailing, but in what direction do we want this to sail? I think that, that's sort of the, the point I got to about six months ago. And uh, one of the things I got onto was this sentence. This is the slogan of European. We transform the world with culture. And I started looking at that and I said, oh, that's interesting. I've been using that slogan for about nine years now, or actually a little bit shorter because we uh, invented that sort of in mid-course. Mid but what does it really mean to me? And is that still applicable in the world that we're in today in 2018? And I gave myself... Um, the opportunity, if you want, to think that through a little bit deeper. Let's dig into this. Let's spend a couple of months digging into this and finding out what that means and if that's still relevant. So what I want to do is share that with you, my, my thought process on that, and I'd hope to have an exchange with you on that as well. Before I start that, uh, here's the sales pitch. Uh, this is European, the European Initiative. Uh, it's, it's become a big organization. It's got three main legs. Uh, I'm responsible for the uh, platform operator, uh, the foundation, but there's also a group of aggregators, uh, content partners, where the archives are being harvested, and there's a network, a big network of 2,000 people. Uh, we share ideas like you're doing here at the IIPC, 
Um, so the sales pitch is this. Uh, if you want to share your material, please do so via the European Aggregators Forum. We'd love to have that. If you're a Java developer, please join my team. Anyone here who's Java developer, Java 8, 7? Great, I'd like to talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice place in The Hague that you'll be, you'll be working with. Right. And you can join the, uh, the European Network Association. I'm sure that uh, I really want to have some more crossovers between IIPC, other organizations, and European. You can join this for free, and you get all kinds of cool benefits. So that's a sales pitch. Now, <clears throat> let's get into this. Uh, my question that I pose to myself is transforming into what? What do we mean by that? And I'm, I'm sure that you've heard this word digital transformation plenty of times. Uh, you're, on, you're in the world of digital transformation. This is the buzzword at the moment uh, in the European Commission. <clears throat> How does Europe transform digitally? And the question I'm posing myself, and I think we should ask ourselves, all of us in this room, is what does that mean? Transforming into what? What, what do we mean by that? What, what needs to be transformed then? And how do we influence that? Is there a possibility for us to do that? So here we go. I started reading, I started talking. Uh, here's a stack of books that uh, really influenced me over the past uh, six months. Um, you know how that goes. You start in one book and then you talk about it with someone and they say, ah, if you like this, you should, like, you should also read that. And then you go all over the place. Uh, so I'm not going to bore you with the whole line of thinking that I have uh, in reading, but I want to talk to you about a couple of books that I think are really relevant to us. So here we go. The first book I read is, uh, that I'd like to share with you uh, some thoughts on is Sapiens by Yuval Harari. Um, can you just raise your hands if you read that book? Yeah. Hey. Because it's one of the best-seller books at the moment. Uh, if you haven't read it, do read it. It's an amazing book. It's one of those history books where the man can both talk on a micro level and is a really good storyteller, and he can give you that really big breath uh, that you're looking for. So <clears throat> what we get from Yuval Harari is really the, the story of the wise man, Homo sapiens, and how that evolved and the effects that we've had over the course of history. So in this picture, of course, <clears throat> you see the Big Bang that's about 13.8 uh, billion years ago uh, until now. In between, this is not a good reflection of how it actually went, right? Uh, he's got this really good uh, example where if you spread your arms like this, and then the Big Bang is right here, this right hand top, then humanity starts at the finger top. That's where 100,000 years ago uh, Homo sapiens starts. So life only starts here. Right, micro microbiology or what? So about 100,000 years ago, that's that's man, uh, Homo sapiens. Uh, 10,000 years ago, we find a way of working together, agriculture, uh, and I think that's where the crux of the transformation really starts. Right, it's the frontal uh, lobe in our brain that allows us to work together. And I think the power of Homo sapiens, as Yuval Harari expresses it, is that. We're better than anyone else because we found language. We can talk to each other and therefore we're much stronger together. I think the together part is really the one I want to pause on than all the other animals around us because they don't have that way of working together. So there's lots of other interesting things in science, but that's, that's one thing I wanted to share with you. Now, he also takes us to the end of that line, right? This is where we are. This is where you guys uh, operate. Uh, 30 years of the web, probably digital is a little bit older than that, but there's an explosion going on, right? And we're right in the middle of it, right? 1990s, the early web browsers, Netscape, uh, Internet Explorer, um, Facebook around 2004, the web becomes social, iPhone in 2007, and we become mobile. And I think in 2013, about 40% of all the people in the world are connected to the web. And I think that is only going to continue, right? It's not going to stop. Everyone will be connected very soon. So if we understand that, uh, we also start understanding the next book, Homo Deus, which is the sequel to Sapiens. Who's read Homo Deus? Are you, you also read Sapiens then, I suppose, right? Yeah. Right. So what's really cool about this is that he first takes us back 
to the history of humankind, and then he takes us forward in his fantasy about you know, how life could develop given this digital revolution that we're in. Now, if you read literature uh, and, and criticisms, uh, you'll see that this book is heavily criticized uh, by many people, which is normal, because it's not easy to figure out and have a, a vision about the future, and it's arbitrary. Uh, but the picture that he, that he starts to paint for us is a picture where, with parallel computing power, combined with big data and smart algorithms, I mean, that's the real revolution that we're in right now, um, robots, artificial intelligence uh, will start to take over humankind. Now, whether you want to buy into that or not is really not the topic of my discussion. But this is really where we need to pause and ask ourselves a question when we start thinking about we transform the world with culture. What does this question mark mean to us? Now, I'm going to take you through another little spin <coughs> in my journey through books and, and literature. I've also started to get really interested in, are we actually able to influence the course of history? Uh, is that even possible? Transformation and we transform implies an active mode where we can actually consider ourselves as active, directive minds that can actually influence things. So, in order to understand that a little bit better, you need to dig into behavioral psychology, behavioral economics. Uh, a lot has been written about that at the moment. One book that I particularly liked was Nudge by uh, Thaler and Sunstein. Um, what it tells us, it tells us a little bit about how the brain works. I think the essence of it is that uh, in our brain, compared to <coughs> um, th this is the human homo sapiens brain compared to other brains, we are able to delay the relationship between input and output, right? We're not like animals anymore where, you know, something comes in front of me and I either hit it, eat it, or run away. <coughs> We're able to process things. And by being able to process things, that means that there is a level of creativity and a level of uh, transformative power that is being developed. In Nudge, Tan and Sunstein call that the choice architecture. And I thought that was a really interesting concept. So we're all choice architects of our own lives, right? I can either choose to drink this or not to drink this. Um, I, I choose to be here or I could have chosen not to be here. Although that, that would have been a difficult one, right? Um, <coughs> and with Nudge, uh, he explains or they explain us that, you know, nudging is a way of pushing the brain in a certain direction and it's something that in behavioral psychology at the moment is, is, is a big thing and then in policy levels these people are thinking about that. How can we make a better society where well-being is more important and we can increase our well-being? There are many interesting concepts there. The availability heuristic as they call it was one that I wanted to highlight uh, because it's very understandable. Uh, our brains are wired to because we're, our brains are not that powerful, not as powerful as the computers we're working with, we need to be very, very efficient. So we automate, that's what we do. And the availability heuristic tells us that we are prone to take the things that are readily available to us. The most available, uh, understandable way of, of looking at that is in the supermarket, you know, if you put the candy bar on top, that's the thing that you'll take, right? If in the cafeteria people put uh, the fruit on top, that's the thing that you will take. So you can orchestrate your environment in a way that makes it, uh, that you can have an influence over your life. I think there's some really interesting concepts there that we need to take to heart if we take transformation really seriously. This guy, Steven Pinker, um, heavily criticized in the digital, in, in the humanities. Uh, I think he's a brilliant thinker. Uh, his, his main thesis is that we're fooling ourselves as humans to think that we're actually in a pretty bad shape at the moment. If you think, and this is his, his thesis, uh, but he's pretty convincing. He's got all kinds of statistics that show that we've done an incredible job over the past 300 years in making our world a better place, right? The level, levels of literacy, the levels of or Ill illiteracy, the levels of poverty have gone down dramatically. Uh, this one is a statistics 
that between 1820 and 2019, extreme poverty, people not being able to buy a meal at the end of the day, has gone down to 90% of the population to about 10% of the population. Now, if you read this book, you'll be baffled. You'll see that it's incredible what we've been able to do using the choice architecture that our brain allows us to, allows us to do. Of course, it's been criticized because not everything is Humpty Dory at the moment, right? Um, we're not in that fantastic place. He also shows us how our brain works in that, in that respect. He, he, he tells us about, you know, the perception of our world might not always be the same as the reality of the world. So what you see here is a, I thought that was amazing, um, um, a graphic representation of a sentiment mining exercise he did on the New York Times articles between 1945 and 2010. And it wouldn't be hard to argue that between 1945, after the Second World War, until 2010, you know, in most ways, our life went up, right? We got more wealthy, we, uh, our lives became better, we got more goods, we got more access to things. Yet the sentiment uh, that is measured by the amount of words that have positive connotations like good compared to words with a bad connotation like terrible went down. So more words terrible and less words good were used in the paper. So that's a reflection of how we think of ourselves, or at least how the papers present the world to us. So there is a big difference between how the world actually goes and how we perceive the world to be. The final book I'd like to bring to your attention uh, is this book by Alessandro Barrico uh, called The Game. It's just been released. Actually, I've actually read it, but I've read articles of it in various papers. And what he does is tell us, well, everything that Harry's been telling you before is one of those examples of elitism that we need to be extremely careful about at the moment. The elections have shown us in Europe, uh, all over Europe, that there is no credibility for people like us to say we transform the world with culture if we don't take a couple of things really, really seriously. And one of those things is a broken social contract. We cannot stand on the moral high ground with one finger up saying that people need to change and having our little glass of champagne sipping on the other hand and having luxurious lives. Well, the world is broken. So what are those things? Uh, plenty of things to measure, but there's a couple that I'd like to, to mention here. There is a concentration of wealth and power. Um, the statistics are all over. All over. One percent of the population in America owns over owns more than ninety percent of the bottom half of the, of the population. Now that is a shocking statistic. And not only is it shocking, but the broken social contracts tells us there is no social mobility anymore in the Western world. And I think that is one of the things that we need think about. Now the companies you see here are of course the digital companies that we're facing and that we're dealing with and that we're working with. We cannot work without Google anymore and that's okay. But we need to be very careful about the concentration of wealth and power that comes with uh, the network effect as they say, right? Services become better and artificial intelligence in particular the more people use it. The more people use it the better the service becomes and that's how you create big monopolies. One of the things that we need to think about uh, in the context of web archiving, in my opinion. Second one is extractive business models. We're extracting resources out of the world and we're not giving it back. So this is also where the donut economy, another book I, I really favor, uh, tells us about. There are alternatives. It's just a frame of mind that we think that we need to always go from uh, for more and more wealth and more things. We need to think about this in a more holistic way that is inclusive and not attractive. And finally, the information overload. Fake news, information bubbles, you know, those are the types of things that, uh, that we hear today. Um, it was interesting, I was talking to my children, I uh, have two sons, uh, one of 14 and one of 17. Uh, you know, where did they take their information from? And um, there was such an immense amount of deep ingrained skepsis about what they can still trust. You know, deep fake tells us you can, you, know, you can see videos of Obama saying things you would never say. I mean, that's the level of how people can trick you these days. And my kids are 
growing up in a world of cynicism about truth. And that is something we should take very seriously. <coughs> so, uh, that was a pretty long introduction into my thought process about uh, transformation, but I wanted to share it with you because I think it's important. Uh, I think it's important that we keep seeing ourselves as choice architects in this digital transformation, this digital trans uh, revolution that we're in. And you in particular, as web, web archivists, have that responsibility. Now, I've also told these things to the people in my own office, of course. And they say, wow, well, that's really interesting, Harry. But what's our role in that? You know, what do we do about that? You know? And that is a very legitimate question. What do we do about that? So here are a few thoughts that, uh, on that topic. I think we have an inherent tendency in our world, and I'm looking at you as our world and myself. Let's say that we're the public, not-for-profit, uh, museum, libraries, archives world, right? There's a tendency in our world to downplay ourselves. I think in, in psychology they call that, you know, it's a, it's a blocking assumption. We think that what we're doing is very important, right? Everyone in this room thinks the work you're doing, and rightfully so, is extremely important. We safeguard the memory of the world, right? How important is that in the bigger <coughs> scheme of things? And yet, even yesterday, I noticed in my conversations, when we start talking about ourselves in relation to money, to funding, we downplay ourselves. We're saying, oh, perhaps someone can fund our project. We're talking about things like sustainability. That's a word I really hate. You know, sustainability tells me that you, know, you need to walk on crutches. You need to be sustained. We need to be helped a bit. Instead of seeing ourselves as an investment that we need to make as a society into the future of ourselves. Because if we believe that it's so important, why not also really make our case, right? So I want to show you a couple of numbers that maybe will lift your spirits and tell you, and show you how important you are. So this is the new agenda for culture. Um, last year was the European Year of Cultural Heritage, right? It was a fun year, we did all kinds of cool stuff here in Europe. And it lifted the word cultural heritage up to policy levels that it were where it wasn't before. And the new agenda for culture is the attempt of the European Commission to say, this is our new agenda. Cultural heritage is really, really important. And in very small print, you see the numbers that have now printed that really big. And I did so on purpose. So, we contribute to cultural and creative industries, that's 11 sectors that we are part of, contribute 4.2% to the GDP in the European Union. Now, by all measures, that is a pretty big number. It is not insignificant. I'm going to throw in another number. We employ in our sector 7.8 million people in the culture and creative sector. That is more, and I love this thing, it's more than the automotive and manufacturing sectors together. So the automotive, so it's car builders and manufacturing are smaller than the culture and creative industry by far. But that tells me that we're in the 21st century, right? That the 19th and 20th century is almost past. It's not about cars anymore. It's not about manufacturing. It's still important. But the booming sectors are culture and creative industries. Another one, we employ more young professionals, 15 to 29 year old, than anyone else in Europe, any other sector. Almost 20% of the people in this sector, and I see you guys in the room, are employed in the culture and creative industries. And if you balance that against the problem that we face in Europe, that unemployment uh, in, in that age group is huge, especially in southern countries, 40%, 50%. This is a sector you want to invest in. But it's more, and I think it's not just about numbers, it's not just about economy, it's not only about employment. The significant thing about the new agenda for culture is that it recognized the opportunities for transformation, the transversal 
opportunities of culture and creative industries. So we have a potential to be more than only uh, relevant in, these, in, these, in our own sectors. To, uh, we have the potential to be relevant in education and scholarship, those were the things that were mentioned, uh, for social cohesion and identity. Difficult words, but I think we, we understand that, it, that it's important. An inclusive society that people keep talking about uh, is something that people say, ah, culture and creative industries, those are the people who can actually do something there. <coughs> so let's explore that a little bit. Um, I'm going to give you three examples from uh, my own organization, but there are plenty of people who are working in this space uh, about impact development. That's another key word that has been uh, used uh, and should be used uh, a lot. And I advise you to also join Mr. Simon Tanner's uh, lecture uh, or session on Friday on the subject. So, in essence, what Europeana does is we bring together uh, as much cultural heritage material as possible and we bring it together in a website, right? It's not that complicated um, on the surface. It's actually really complicated in, in real life. That's why I need a Java developer. Okay. Yeah. Um, what have we done so far? We have 58 million uh, records uh, from all over Europe, 35 countries, 37 languages uh, from 4,000 institutions. So that's a logistical operation of scale, right? But on an impact level, we need to think about it differently. So things we like to hear is this. I'd like to thank the Europeana for accelerating the discussion and decision making concerning our licensing policy here at the Finnish National Gallery. So we've been able to accelerate thinking about opening up collections. And um, the impact that we see is that we've changed the perception or the mindset or the way that people at the gallery operate. They had uh, their own collections closed up uh, behind their own website and have now made it available in the public domain, 10,000 objects, beautiful paintings from the 18th, 19th century. And we're super proud of that. Right? That's the type of thing where we can say, yeah, we contributed to the democratization of and access of goods and services. We've been able to work with that open material, if it's open, and brought it into another context in education. And we found out that in order to do that well, you need to package it differently. It's a pretty difficult exercise, right? So we developed a, an, uh, an online open course where teachers, uh, where, we, where we help teachers to make their material, European and cultural material available in their classrooms. If you look at the numbers, we think there are pretty successful, it's really something that you can get a certificate from, so it's a learning experience for some of these teachers. And uh, we started thinking about metrics to measure our success. So I won't go through all of them, but it's about the level of confidence to be able to use things. It's about uh, understanding of, in this case, copyright. It's about how you change the way you teach. And we're still in an experimental phase here, I must say. I think we need to do a lot more work here, but that's the direction we're going. Net promoter scores, how willing are teachers to tell other teachers to go here, those are the metrics that we're playing with. And finally, I think this is the most advanced or deepest uh, activation mode that uh, you'll find my organization to be in. Uh, we started to think about what kind of interventions could we do on topics like migration? Now, we're not a political organization. I mean, I have my own opinions about what I think about migration, but we're not a political organization, and I don't want my organization to be one. But what I do think, when I started thinking it through with my teams, we should do, and we have a responsibility to do, is to allow people to form their own opinion in an unbiased way about that topic. And the thing that I wanted to do with this little project where we brought together, we had about uh, 20 collection days as we called it, and people were invited to bring an object that is relevant to their own migration story. And share that, we digitize it, and we make it available. But what I wanted to do is that 
to see how they change people's perception about migration. And for example, if I look at myself, I see myself as a Dutchman. Uh, I have no migration background, if you'd asked me before this project. But of course you do. I mean, everyone here has. Uh, my parent, my great-grandparents uh, went to Indonesia. And my father was born in Indonesia. And all of that contributes to a migration story <laughs> in my own family. So, was this successful? Was it not? Uh, I think, uh, to a certain extent it was, to a certain extent it wasn't. But it was interesting to dip our toes into the water. And what we did see for it when we started investigating and probing into it is that people felt more confident about their migration and their migration stories after being part of our sessions. So those are the types of things that we've been experimenting with uh, at Europea. So if we think about all this, I mean, there is a world to be changed. And if you believe you're a choice architect, you think, ah, I can actually contribute to that. We understand ourselves better as a sector, as a cultural and creative industry, as an actor, a vector, to be able to do that. <clears throat> and there are areas where we feel confident in doing that, and areas that we just need to experiment in. What does that mean for, let's call that our operating model? What are we together that the market can't do by itself. I think that's the simplest way of looking at it, because that's why we're funded. That's why people pay our salaries. How do we change the concentration of wealth and power into maybe something that looks more like a commons, where rights are being shared across the network, and you give as much as you take? How can we change that extractive business model into a regenerated model that is networked and where information and value flows across the system? And how can we change that information overload into a place or maybe a pocket where we feel that we can take trust and authority seriously? And what is our role with that? And how do we do that? So, there are three things that are core component of that. Uh, I'm still developing my thinking in this, and I'd be very happy to uh, have some input from you and, and have a discourse. But I think that network organizations are the future. Decentralized network organizations, like Wiki, Wikimedia, in a sense like Europeana, perhaps in a sense like EIIPC. Working together will probably be a more effective way of working than being the decentralized hubs that the commercial world is providing. And don't get me wrong, I think commerce is really important and I really believe in commercial organizations as being incredibly important to drive forward innovation. But we need to provide also a public space around that. And I think decentralized network organizations are critical. I believe we need to work on our common language. Uh, <coughs> I've now been working in this environment for about nine years. <coughs> we sort of say the same thing, but we're not always. And when we talk about impacts, we sometimes understand each other and sometimes we don't. And I think it's really important that we develop a framework of value and confidence around it that we all share. And finally, I think it's about interoperability. You understand that better than anyone else. <coughs> Decentralized networks only work if we work following the same standards so that the data can talk to each other and you know what you can do with it. We've invested a lot in this with Europeana, and uh, we hope to work with uh, organizations like you to keep on developing that. So there's a data model based on, uh, on triple stores, um, we have licensing frameworks based on Creative Commons, and we've developed our own right sets around it for exceptions that I think can now apply for everyone in our sector. Um, we've been developing frameworks and advocacy campaigns around openness. And I think those are the types of things that are core in our operating model. So maybe and this is coming from my conversations with uh, someone I really admire, Professor Pierluigi Sacco. He's a professor of um, culture and economics in 
uh, Milan and has been very influential in the cultural sector. And I think his, his work has led me to believe that we need to change how we think of ourselves, not just as a provider of content, fuel for other people to do cool stuff with, uh, creative industries, etc. But let's look at ourselves as a, a, a sandbox, an R&D lab, where we can experiment with this digital transformation in a safe environment. So those are the two things that I wanted to bring to your attention right now. So before I go to my final part, where I'll start talking about that mirror world that I promised uh, you, uh, perhaps now is a good opportunity to add a few remarks or questions for you. I've been talking a lot, so. I'm sure you are impatient to, to ask questions. Yes? Kind of this idea, I think, mentioned near the end of a kind of decentralized network model for kind of public sector and cultural organizations working in the commercial environment. I think one of the challenges we were talking about yesterday at General Assembly was kind of how we engage with those then kind of, you know, kind of the, 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 sort of the global kind of monolithic companies around kind of issues on standards and um, being able to kind of get access to software for preservation purposes, those sorts of things. So one of the big challenges we have is talking to the likes of um, kind of Google, Apple, Microsoft, and mm -hmm. so on, to kind of get a greater understanding of the importance of working with them around preservation. I just wonder if you have any, any thoughts on, on that issue. Yeah, it's an extremely important question. I mean, uh, I hope you don't get from my, from my talk that we should isolate ourselves from those organizations at all. I think. Uh, the best we can do is work with them and try to influence them into a certain direction. And of course, we need to develop shared standards. And one of the frustrations I think we probably all share, but I, I certainly have, is that the material here PM is not always properly indexed by Google, for example. Uh, their knowledge graph is a big black box for me. Uh, and uh, I'm having conversations with them. I think the more we join forces, the more we become you know, a force to be reckoned with, if you want, by the Googles of this world, uh, so that they can uh, open up a little bit uh, their black boxes. And maybe another example is, uh, if you remember the, the Google Book Project, starting in 2005, um, <clears throat> we were able to negotiate European and European Commission and the sector, if you want, uh, the exclusivity of the contracts uh, to a certain level. Right? So I think those, those are the types of things that we need to continue to do. The man who read both Sapiens and Homo Deus. Let's have him. I'm not the only one. <laughs> so, great talk, by the way. Um, I was surprised to notice that there are more people working in culture than in the in the, the automotive uh, industry. It was quite surprising to me. Yeah. But the the everybody values cars, and I cannot say the same about culture. So I think that the problem is that cars are widely accessible, and culture is not. So I like to ask you in the direct question: What is the value? of cultural heritage organizations and culture when the citizens that support them and pay the taxes for them to work cannot access culture? Well, I mean, uh, the short answer to that would be zero. Right? Uh, what I try to argue here is that it's only becoming valuable if we make it open, uh, if, people are, if, if it becomes fluid into the system so that people don't have to come to a website of a culture institution to maybe see a thumbnail this big where they cannot actually use it on social media. That's not going to work. But if we make it high resolution, openly available, and actually push it out to the Wikimedias of the world, etc., that's where the value starts to become apparent, yeah. So openness is absolutely a precondition. 
speak. Yep. Thanks. If uh, you thought about, um, I mean, there's a difference between culture and cultural heritage institution, in my opinion. Um, and uh, we are cultural heritage institutions. And of the, the part of the sector you mentioned, I guess that uh, many people would uh, uh, be using Game of Thrones, for instance, <coughs> but may maybe not our own newspapers from Denmark. So. Uh, I think, uh, have you thought about, uh, as cultural heritage institutions, what our impact is? Is it directly interacting with uh, the citizens, or is it more indirectly through authors like uh, 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 those you mentioned uh, to influence the citizens? I mean, th there's a difference, and I think it's important for us as uh, cultural heritage institutions to be aware of where to uh, put our impact. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of course, I mean, it would be delusional to think that uh, because we make things digitally available, even openly available, uh, for example, archival material, there, there are miles and miles of archives that will have very limited uh, direct reuse by the general public. That's delusional. Uh, it wasn't so in the analog world, it will not be in the in the, in, the, in the digital world. But I'm going to show you a couple of examples where if we, if we break down our mental barriers of what we think of as an archive or a library or a museum and think of that as, let's say, big data from the past, that it might become useful in a very different way than we, than we would have imagined. And we need to open ourselves to that type of thinking. I think, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, you know, the cultural heritage sector versus the rest. I think you're right. There are still some, some big differences between are you a creative entrepreneur, uh, an app builder, uh, a filmmaker, and a museum or a library uh, person. But think about it. Ten years ago, uh, a library and a museum person wouldn't even talk to each other. They wouldn't even consider themselves part of a cultural heritage. Uh, of the cultural heritage sector. I think that's one of the things that I know would proud Europeana to have helped break down those barriers. And there are more barriers to, uh, to deal with. Was there another question there? We still have some eight minutes. Right. So let's get down to the last bit. Um, So let's talk about mirror world. Um, so of all the books I've been reading and all the articles, there was one that completely blew my mind. And that was the article Mirror World by uh, an author, uh, Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly uh, is one of the founding members of Wired magazine. Uh, he calls himself, I think, uh, a digital maverick or something along those lines. And I have to tell you, I'm, I'm not a science fiction person. I really don't like it, I don't get it, uh, it's too far out there. Uh, you know, I'm a historian. But I do want to know what is, and that's what I am interested in, you know, people can tell me in a plausible way uh, what is going to be next in the midterm. Let's, let's go <coughs> 10, 15 years. That's, I think, the period we need to be concerned about, and you should be concerned about as web archivists. And he wrote this amazing article called Mirror World. And um, what he does, he actually takes the line of thinking from Yuval Harari about Homo Deus. And he's not going to talk about the next 200 years. He's going to talk about the next 50 years. And he talks about a world that is close to us and yet far away enough that it's hard to actually grasp it. So what I want to do in order to get you a flavor of what that world looks like, I'm going to read to you old-fashioned reading from Uncle Harry. I'm going to read to you a couple of, a couple of uh, parts from that article that I think are very significant, so bear with me. 
So what is the mirror world? And I quote, the mirror world doesn't yet fully exist, but it is coming. Someday soon, likely in the next 10, 15 years, every place and thing in the real world, every street, every lamppost, building and room, will have its full-size digital twin in the mirror world. For now, only tiny patches of the mirror world are visible through AR headsets. Piece by piece, these virtual fragments are being stitched together to form a shared, persistent place that will parallel the real world. Google Earth has long offered a hint of what this mirror world will look like. It's already under construction. Deep in the research labs of tech companies around the world, scientists and engineers are racing to construct virtual places that overlay actual places. Crucially, these emerging digital landscapes will feel real. They'll exhibit what landscape architects call placeness. The street view images in Google Maps are just facades, flat images hinged together. But in a mirror world, a virtual building will have volume, a virtual chair will exhibit chairness, and a virtual street will have layers of textures, gaps, cracks, and intrusions that all convey a sense of street. At first, the mirror world will appear to us as a high-resolution stratum of information overlaying the real world. We might see a virtual name tag hovering in front of people we previously met. It's useful for me because I tend to forget people's names. <laughs> Perhaps a blue arrow showing us the right place to turn a corner. On this platform, all things and places will be machine readable, subject to the power of algorithms. Also, like its predecessors, the web and social media, this new platform will unleash the prosperity of thousands more companies in its ecosystem and a million new ideas and problems that weren't possible before machines could read the world. Skip part. Augmented reality is the technology underpinning the mirror world. It's the awkward newborn that will grow into a giant. Mirror worlds immerse you without removing you from the space. You're still present, but on a different plane of reality. So you can picture this world, right? Everything has a digital component on top of it. We can look around this room and, and with our devices that we'll, that we'll have then, interpret that world in, in an augmented way. But here's where it becomes really interesting to us. I'm quoting again. Time is a dimension in the mirror world that can be adjusted. Unlike the real world, but very much like the world of software apps, you'll be able to scroll back. History will be a verb. With a swipe of your hand, you'll be able to go back in time at any location and see what came before. You'll be able to lay a reconstructed 19th century view right over the present reality. To visit an earlier time and location, you simply revert to a pre previous version kept in the log. As archivists, take note of this. The entire mirror world will be like a world, Word or Photoshop file that you can keep undoing. In this way, the mirror world will be best referred to as a 4D world. End of quote. Now, if this is a reality that you can believe in, the more I read that article, the more I started reading articles around it. I start to believe that that world will be a reality very soon. That's what the big companies, uh, the tech companies, are building at the moment. And with the uh, ubiquity of cameras around the world, this will happen. It will cause all kinds of problems around privacy. It will cause all kinds of problems around archiving. So you have a job for the rest of your life, believe me. Um, but it also gives us a lot of very interesting opportunities. And as a historian, this is a world I want to be in. If, if there's a 4D world to be uncovered, that I can walk around in my own street and see who lived in what place and what did they do, etc. I mean, what an amazing world we could create out of that. How imaginative and how real history could be if we do that. So what we need for that, the basis of that is what uh, we call now start calling big data from the past. So we need to not only digitize everything that we have, uh, the 300 million books, the 18 million songs that we have, um, the 60 trillion web pages that you are concerned with. Um, we need to digitize, make all of that available in, in, 
in interoperable and open ways. And as you can see in the big iceberg on top there, we've only digitized about 22%, we estimate, of uh, digital cultural heritage in Europe. So there's an immense amount of work that we need to do, and we need to accelerate that if we want to catch up with the mirror world that's coming ahead of us. So, to conclude, uh, we've developed, and we need to develop innovation agendas, uh, and I encourage you to do that as well. We need to make sure that with confidence we go to the European Commission and to your member states and, any, and the funders that, that, that we need for this, and not to support us, but to invest into a future that can really contribute to a more healthy and uh, an interesting society. And uh, recently, I want to really, really bring this to your attention, a new project has uh, started that is really gaining traction, it's called Time Machine. And Time Machine is aiming to do exactly that, to mass digitize uh, our archives, to use artificial intelligence, to 3D that, use computer science technologies, to stitch that together and, and start creating that world. And I encourage you to look into that and, uh, and participate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for taking us from the past to the future. We still cannot imagine. Um, we are good on time. We still have a minute or two for a question. or.